Hi team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, John from NSP. It's Ukraine War. Uh, update extra video, you're going to get extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. This is going to be a fairly divisive video because uh, I'm going to be talking about American politics and it's part of the video I recorded the other day um, and I had to cut it off. And actually, I'm not going to give you the excerpts. I'm going to re-record it totally. So I've got this really fascinating uh, document that has been sent to me by Pierre that is, uh, honestly, it's it is going to be really interesting to look through. I haven't read through it properly yet. Uh, so I'm going to do that kind of live with you because sometimes I just don't have all the time in the world to do this. But this is a document that's uh, from Trumpist to Communist, the forces in the US impeding aid to Ukraine and how they do it. This is kind of on the back of what I said earlier today, which is to talk about Tommy Tuberville and how he has just come out and said blatant Russian propaganda in favour of of Russia and against Ukraine in a, a chat with Steve Bannon, who is one of the big thinkers behind Trump's uh, previous presidency and is hope uh, as as Trump would hope for his new presidency in, tw in November 2024. Uh, you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene. You've got a whole suite. You've got Tucker Carlson. We've got Jared Kushner, who's involved in Serbia. And part of that deal for his property buy in Serbia is anti-NATO um, memorial being built there. You've got a Donald Trump Jr. with Tucker Carlson presently in anti well, in pro-Russian El Salvador, this whole ecosystem in the US that is so far removed from Reagan Republicanism uh, from 20 years ago that it's absolutely uh, terrifying, I think, because you have so many people in the United States actively um, for, you know, really the Kremlin's intentions. They are, they are unwitting or witting agents of the Kremlin. And even people on my thread who are pro-Ukraine have some of them who are still pro-Trump have, I think, what cognitive dissonance going on in their minds and are trying to argue that Trump is the the right person for the presidency in November 2024. And probably on, the, on account of all of Trump's other positions, although he's not really clear on his positions, he doesn't actually present any policy. He's fairly uh, vacant in that respect, just dog whistles, these particular points that speak to people. And people take that idea of what he's saying and say, right, I now, because I'm pro-Ukraine, but also pro-Trump, I need to adapt Trump to being pro-Ukraine. And so they'll do things in their minds that will say, well, Trump will be good for Ukraine because of X, Y, and Z. But it's a contortion of reality that is making Trump fit to them rather than Trump actually already fitting to that pro-Ukrainian point of view. And so I think people jump through hoops, they gerrymander, they mentally gerrymander in order to make Trump fit in with what they would like to see in terms of Ukraine. Now, I know that's a big accusation for some of you watching this and you'll know that I'm talking about you, but I genuinely think there is an issue with being both a Trump supporter and a Ukraine supporter, at least you can do that, but you have to just admit something. You say, look, I am a Trump supporter because I really feel strongly about X, Y, and Z that Trump is really good on, in my opinion, like you would say. Uh, I, I feel so strongly for Trump on X, Y, and Z that I will forgive him being wrong on Ukraine. Now, that is a genuinely uh, justifiable position. But I don't think you can justify saying, look, I'm really for Trump on X, Y, and Z. And, and I also think he's going to be really good for Ukraine because everything that he said, everything his family have said and everything his, his supporters have said and everything his advisors have said very clearly points to him not being pro-Ukraine. I've done a whole video on that and I think the evidence is in. I, I think it's just indisputable that he's not good for Ukraine. But we're going to have a look a little bit at... Um, at Biden, then look at what's going on in, in the US and look at why people in Europe are a bit uh, scared about the the election in 2024 November time, the US presidential election. But we'll start with the Biden uh, talk in uh, to, to Time magazine. Now, it's the same guy that interviewed 
Trump recently in a really fascinating in-depth article or in time it's Massimo Calabresi we are the world power how Joe Biden leads and the article does several things here uh, it, it gives you the article and get, obviously it's, it's the article that is Massimo Calabresi's interpretation as all articles are it's the interpretation of the writer they're bringing their baggage to interpreting what their interviewee is is saying and presents a narrative around that uh, but the good thing about these time articles is they present also the transcript of the interview so it's actually the the base um you know data about you know uh, it's the words of Biden right unedited and the same was was for Trump as well there was that transcript of that too but also they they provide a fact check to both uh, both interviewees so Biden has a fact check that I think something like 760 words which I think is is interesting where it fact checks him but the fact check on Trump was something like 4,200 words. So it's something like six times longer. And the fact checks that Biden gets is like, oh, he said it was a billion people in China, but it's actually 1.4 billion. It's like, you know, th those kind of fact checks. And the fact checks on Trump are like, whoa, mate, you made some proper dodgy claims there. And I think that kind of sums up what, you know, what my views are on Biden and Trump. Biden is a kind of fairly safe pair of hands. He's, he's too old for the job. I, I think he's a bit of an appeaser on, well, he's an anti-escalation person somewhat, uh, and he's easily influenced by Jake Sullivan. Uh, but he's doing a, a fairly okay job in supporting Ukraine. I think it could be stronger, but it's a world away from what Trump would do. And uh, Trump, I think, would be an absolute disaster for the free world, right? Uh, and and I would much go for for a weaker um fairly safe pair of hands in biden than than a very dangerous pair of hands in trump and i think you can tell that from just fact checking like trump lives in this post post truth reality and biden uh, doesn't and uh, he, yeah so his transcript is interesting it's fairly raw i mean he bumbles through a few things but it, but essentially it's very clear on what he believes which is that um you know putin's a bad guy and he argues a few things well it says it says some key things like the u.s gives a lot of money to ukraine or, or spends a lot of money in supporting ukraine but actually the the eu or europe does more and he very openly admits that which is about time because trump lies on that so that's important to to make clear he also talks about nato and i'm not, not some people have interpreted this really uh in a way where they excoriate biden for saying this i'm i'm not too sure about it he talks about the answer not necessarily being uh, um ukraine in nato right he, he says that it's not necessary that Ukraine needs to be a part of NATO for us to support uh, Ukraine and for Ukraine to prevail. So we look at this part of the transcript. He says that peace looks like making sure Russia never, never, ne never occupies Ukraine. That's what peace looks like. And it doesn't mean Ukraine. They are part of NATO. So, it, and it doesn't. But I think that, that because they can't be, right? While they are at war, Ukraine, it's just trivially true that Ukraine can't become a part of NATO. They can't accede as a warring nation to NATO. So you'd have to wait some way off down the line and there would have to be some hoops to be jumped through, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the end goal should be Ukraine getting into NATO. But I understand that it becomes a bit, a bit of a political football and it becomes a hot potato, possibly, if you're talking about very explicitly about Ukraine being part of NATO. So I think it, you can possibly explain this as a bit of safe play, uh, cautiously saying, look, it's not, it, it's, they don't have to be part of NATO because then it, the argument is shifted elsewhere. It's like, we need Ukraine to prevail. And that's what we're wor worried about. And but as, But of course, as soon as they do prevail, then you can start really talking about Ukraine becoming part of NATO. Now, the contingency the Ukraine have put in place is the, are these bilateral agreements with lots of nations around Europe and hopefully with the US, that's just about to be completed, I believe, which is that these are 
a form of Article 5, in a sense. So Article 5 means that if one NATO nation is attacked, all other NATO nations come to their aid. But in the event that Ukraine don't get into NATO, then they can have these individual agreements with with a number of countries. I think they've got a dozen in place at the moment, which and hopefully they mean that if Ukraine is attacked, so if Russia does a peace deal with Ukraine and then they come back for a second bite of the apple like 10 years later, then Ukraine can invoke all these individual arrangements that mean that those countries come to the aid of Ukraine. It might not be troops on the ground, but it but it, it'd be more formal support of Ukraine. That goes some way to mitigating not being in NATO. And it also means it, it, even if they are granted accession to NATO, that might take 10 years. So in the intervening time period, there are arrangements in place that fill that gap. So it's very sensible of Ukraine to do that. And I, I'm not one, and I'm not trying to be positive for Biden here. I just think it, it is it's, it's okay because Biden won't be in power by the time, even if he does get another four-year tenure, by the time Ukraine are, are looking at realistically entering NATO. So I think he can kick that to the long weeds and say, right, we're not going to have big arguments about that. Let's Let's just make sure Ukraine win. Uh, and of course, I think he should talk about victory much more openly. He does talk about NATO in in other ways as well. He talks about Finland, and um, it, he he talks about how it's uh, Finland. So what does he say here? While I was in one of the G seven meetings in Europe, when I got back, I called the president of Finland because I when I met when I met earlier in the year with Putin. Putin said that he wanted to see the Finland. Uh, no, he said. Sorry, the uh, fin- Finland leader said he wanted to see the Finlandization of NATO. In other words, Biden, you've just met with Putin. I want. I'm a bit scared now as a leader of Finland. I want to see fin- the Finlandization of NATO. I told him uh, he's he's gonna get not the Finlandization, but the NATOization of Finland. And everybody thought, including you guys, thought it was crazy. And guess what? I did it. I did it. So he then takes the plaudits for Finland being becoming part of NATO. I don't know how much he can do that. I'm, I'm not really sure about the workings there, whether it is US to say so and whether Biden had responsibility for that. Uh, it's a bit like Trump saying, you know, I did this, I did that, as he always does. So I don't know if there's an element that this was Biden or whether he was an integral uh, component of getting Finland into NATO. But you've also got Sweden. So NATO has got stronger under under Biden, that is kind of empirically true. Whether it has anything to do with him, I don't know. Um, he talks about Ukraine again in in NATO. He said, uh, the one thing I was saying is that I'm I'm not prepared to support the NATOization of Ukraine. It should not. It is not. I spent a month in Ukraine when I was senator and vice president. There was significant corruption. There was a circumstance that was really difficult. And so the point is, though, uh, remember, this is all very conversational. This is the unedited speech of Biden that if uh, we ever let Ukraine go down, mark my words, you'll see Poland go and you'll see all those nations along the actual border of Russia from the Balkans to Belarus, all those, they're going to make their own accommodations. So it's this idea that we can't let Ukraine lose because the rest of Europe will go, but I don't see Ukraine being in NATO, um, at least, you know, not yet. Okay, so there is that. But I, I think generally Biden's position on geopolitics in what he says regarding Russia and Ukraine are absolutely right. He talks about Russia's essentialism, talks about, hey, and even pulls it out. He said, have you read Putin's speech? Like, go and read Putin's speech. Like, this talks about like the Russian essentialism, which is that the Ukraine, as Putin sees it, is an essential part of Russia. And it, it, this is troubling. And, and he, he, he talks to that very well. And he understands that in a way that I just can't imagine Trump ever pulling as, uh, have you read P- Putin's speech? Have you actually read it? Here we've got like Putin talking about X, Y, and Z. You're like, Trump's not like that. He doesn't read anything like that. He just, he looks at pictures and then comes out with big sweeping dog whistle statements. So yeah, I don't know. Um, he just laid out straight out. He said, he said, I would like to emphasize again. So he's paraphrasing Putin. Ukraine is not a neighboring country of us. It is an inalienable part of our own history, culture, and spiritual space. Uh, Since time immemorial, the people living in the southwest of what has historically been Russia, Russian land, have called themselves Russians and Orthodox Christians. And he goes on. So so 
uh, Biden says about Putin. He makes the whole speech about why it is part of re-establishing the Soviet Union. Putin knows, uh, sorry, Biden knows what's going on here, okay? This is, uh, this represents a clarity of thought of Biden. He may be an old man. Uh, he may stumble over some of the things he says in the transcript here, but the thought processes are clear and he's got a really solid grasp of the geopolitics involved in Russia and NATO and Ukraine. And I could say, you know, more talk about Macron, um, talks about Afghanistan, so on and so forth. All right. So I am, I, I come away from, you know, reading this article, not worried about Biden um, and where the US are at geopolitically speaking. I think they should be stronger and I think they should have helped Ukraine more. And I don't uh, really have a lot of time for people like Jake Sullivan. Uh, I think Anthony Blinken it should be taken more seriously in that sort of relationship. But you could argue even he might be a little bit, you know, less robust than he, than he could be. Okay, that's my position on Biden. Now, we're going to go into discussing a little bit of Trump now because everyone is scared in Europe about Trump. That's what this article talks about. Uh, it, it, it is an Atlantic piece and it's a very long piece typically. So it's headlined here. The actual headline is different, but it comes up on Twitter as Europeans are watching the US election very, very closely. OK, so what Europe fears is the actual title, American Allies see a second Trump term as all but inevitable. The anxiety, quote, the anxiety is massive by McKay Coppins. The premise of this article is that those in Europe are actually in, in positions of power and influence are much more worried about the elections in the US than they are about their own elections going on in Europe, even though there are super important elections taking place. Because actually, it has a huge impact on the future of NATO, the future of Europe, uh, in terms of the US-European uh, relationship and uh, economic ties and military ties, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So economy, defence, security, uh, cyber, information, you know, the, the, the outcome of that US election is massive. And of course, the threat from Russia from the east, the very tangible threat as they are moving through Ukraine. Uh, what happens in November has... Uh, a lot uh, of impact on how Europe are, able, are going to be able to deal with the threat of Russia going forward. Now, this concerns, as as mentioned, sort of diplomats and politicians, uh, but also the, there's reference to one one diplomat that Trump put in place in Germany, and just gives you a, a reflection of Trump's thinking with that sort of person being in that position. So I've highlighted a number of excerpts from this, so hopefully it gives you a flavour without having to read it all. As I said, it's massive. Quote, uh, so from the article, uh, the undercurrent of dread at Truman Hall was not unique. I encountered it in nearly every conversation I had while travelling through Europe this spring. In capitals across the continent, from Brussels to Berlin, Warsaw to Tallinn, uh, leaders and diplomats expressed a sense of alarm bordering on panic at the prospect of Donald Trump's re-election. So this, this is the premise of the article I was mentioning, is that this person goes across Europe, meeting these people, getting their opinions on a Trump presidency. Uh, whether you are for or against Trump or whether you're bored of this subject or, or, or not, it is indisputable that it is incredibly important to Europe and that Europeans see it as incredibly important. That's why it's, it, I think, incumbent upon me to talk about it. Fear of losing Europe's most powerful ally has translated into a pathologically intense fixation on, um, on the US presidential race. European officials can explain the Electoral College in granular detail and cite polling data from battleground states. Thomas Bagger, the state secretary in the German foreign ministry, told me that in a year when billions of people in dozens of countries around the world will get the chance to vote, quote, the only election all Europeans are interested in is the American election. Almost every official I spoke with believed that Trump is going to win. And of course, you can call that into question, but that's where it's going. The irony of Europe's obsession with the upcoming election is that the people who will decide its outcome aren't thinking about Europe much at all. In part, that's because many Americans haven't seen the, fee the need for NATO in their lifetime, despite the fact that on September the September 11th terrorist attacks were the only time Article 5 has been invoked. It's really important, by the way. So every time that... Uh, Certain people, uh, Trump's done this, claim that Europeans aren't paying enough into NATO or paying enough into their own defence 
uh, sectors or on spending enough on defense to qualify for NATO membership. I know it's a bit informal. It's not, it's not like if you don't qualify, you're out, but it was this, it was this understanding back in, when was it? Goodness me, two, oh, I can't remember the year now, but it, it wasn't, it's not been massively long standing. this idea that you've got to spend 2% of GDP, as far as I remember. Anyway, at the beginning, there were only three nations uh, I think it might even talk about that here uh, at some point. There are only three nations who spent 2%, uh, UK, US and Greece, I think it was. And now there are 18, going to be 18 nations. So that has really changed. And we'll talk about why in a wee while. But actually, Article 5 was only invoked, has, has only been invoked at September the 11th. And actually, loads of European nations came to America's aid in supplying resources, troops and whatnot for the fight against terrorism, uh, fight against terror. And that was actually... An, an example of us coming to help the US. And that's the only time Article 5 has been invoked. As one journalist in Brussels put it to me, the Alliance has for decades been, quote, a solution in search of a problem. Now, with Russia waging a war dangerously close to NATO territory, there's a large problem. Throughout my conversations, one word came up again and again when I asked, about, asked European officials about the stakes of the American election. Existential. Quote, the anxiety is massive, Victoria Newland, who served until recently as Undersecretary for Political Affairs at the State Department, told me. Like other diplomats in the Biden administration, she has spent the three plus years since Trump unwillingly left office working to restabilize America's relationship with its allies. Uh, quote, foreign counterparts would say it's to me straight up, Newland recalled. The first Trump election, maybe people didn't understand who he was or it was an accident. A second Trump uh, a second election of Trump? We'll never trust you again. So this is what, albeit a Democrat diplomat says of Trump, is that, you know, European uh, people, counterparts are worried. They are telling me if Trump gets in again, we just, there will just be no trust between us. Don't shoot the messenger. That is, that is what the claim is to understand why european governments are so worried about trump's return you could simply you could study his erratic behavior at international summits his fraught relationship with ukraine's president and open admiration for russia's his general aversion to the liberal international order order or you could look at the exceedingly irregular tenure of trump's ambassador to germany richard grenell okay before we get to him so remember that at the helsinki summit which i still maintain is Trump's worst uh, foreign diplomacy moment in his entire four years. It was freaking horrendous, where he stood there, fawned over Putin and, and basically said, I trust Putin more than I trust my own intelligence services. And then suggested oh, tr that Putin had a great idea and that he should come and send his Russians over to the US, into the US to investigate our guys in order to help find out what the truth is. It's just like, anyway, it was just, it was terrible. And then you had him trying to blackmail Zelensky and et cetera, et cetera. But you could, you could worry about all of that, but says uh, Coppins, the author, you could also look to Richard Grenell, who was Trump's ambassador to Germany. And then it details this highly controversial um, Trump ambassador to Germany. Um, and it says later, as Trump escalated his crusade against European political establishment, publicly rooting for Merkel's right-wing opponents and identifying the Europe's European Union as a foe, goodness me, uh, Grenell seemed eager to join in. So this is the idea that Trump at the time was calling the EU a foe, an enemy, uh, while fawning over Putin. I mean, this is where Trump is. And this is why Trump wanted the UK out, out of the EU. He wanted Brexit because you break up that power structure, the US could take uh, advantage of that and his transactional nat nature rather than having allies so that you can, like a, a positive sum game where you can both improve your lot and both become more secure. It's about, no, you, if you guys are weaker, we can take advantage of that and we can get better deals, et cetera, et cetera. So he wanted, you know, UK to break out Brexit, uh, break out of the EU, which is exactly what uh, Putin wanted for fairly similar, re similar reasons, although takes it a step further in terms of national security as well. Throw that on, on there. And, you know, Trump isn't too bothered about NATO, about what it offers. He doesn't really understand how alliances work in that positive sum game method. He's very much a zero sum game, which is 
your loss is my gain. And so everything else needs to be less so that we are, are more. And really interesting analysis along those lines from Madeleine Albright's book, Fascism, where she has a whole section on Trump and says his transactional uh, foreign diplomacy is is that zero sum game approach was really problematic because international diplomacy doesn't work like that you can think like that maybe in domestic business interactions so that's what he's taking from being a businessman but it doesn't apply to international diplomacy it can apply at certain times but it's not it's not a rubric by which you should do your international diplomacy it's about alliances it's about using each other for mutual gains against you know collective challenges such as china such as russia but if you start seeing everyone as a competitor, including the EU, including the UK, including everyone, then you start to isolate yourself, which then feeds into that, that I, I guess, his, his overarching isolationist approach. Anyway, it goes on to talk about Grenell and, and how, as a Trumpian, he was, was yeah, bad news, really. Then goes to Brussels, gets some examples from uh, diplomats in, in Brussels, uh, which then goes to po Poland. We're going to join it a bit later. A lot, really fascinating article uh, of all these examples of how basically people are worried about uh, a new Trumpian, a uh, new Trump tenure, and how it was problematic back when it back from 2016 to 2020. Then we go to Frankenberg in Germany, and we're going to join it there. Uh, so much later in the article, whether Trump wins or not, there's a growing consensus in Europe that the strain of American politics he represents, a throwback to the hard edge isolationism of the 20s and 30s, isn't going away. It's become common uh, in the past year for politicians to talk about the need for European defence autonomy. Uh, quote, we can't just flip a coin every four years and hope that Michigan voters will vote in the right direction. Benjamin Haddad, a member of France's National Assembly, said at an event earlier this year, quote, we have to make, take matters into our own hands. What exactly that would look like is a subject of intense debate. Italy's foreign minister recently proposed forming a European army, European Union army, an idea that's been raised and rejected many times in the past. Others have suggested diverting resources from NATO to a separate European defence alliance, though European countries are not immune to that kind of populist nationalism. That that could make such an alliance uh, dysfunctional. Replacing the so-called nuclear umbrella provided by the US arsenal would require countries such as Germany and Poland to develop their own nuclear stockpiles to supplement the small ones France and the United Kingdom already have. Within NATO, the immediate priority is, quote, Trump-proofing the alliance. In the past 18 months, Finland and Sweden have joined, each bringing relatively capable high-tech militaries. Secretary General Stoltenberg has also proposed shifting responsibility for Ukrainian arms deliveries from the US to NATO in case of the next administration decides to abandon the war. This is really important. So if and many people are still saying this, John Bolton is going around saying this, and he was a security advisor to Trump and says we shouldn't vote for Trump. He's too dangerous. And he will take his he will take the US out of NATO. So you have many people saying this. Now, if Trump does take the US out of NATO or does things that effectively nullifies the US's position within NATO, then there need to be mitigations put in place, either a kind of substitute or an alternative for NATO or more nations in NATO to dilute the power of the of US. And hence Sweden and Finland being very useful, not only capable militaries, but also, you know, more people in NATO. It is a genuine concern because um, NATO is essentially a component of the US foreign military and political strategy. I, again, I just don't think Trump has enough um, knowledge and intelligence. I don't mean that der der in a derogatory way, I, as in, I guess, of course I do. But it's not like, oh, you're so thick. I just don't think he's just learned the knowledge. I'm not saying he couldn't learn the knowledge. He just, he just doesn't realise all these things partly because I don't think he has the capacity to sit down and be briefed enough. Like that, when he was president, if you remember, he didn't take daily briefings. He stopped having daily briefings. And there were people that, that came out and said, yeah, we only give him briefings if they include pictures. And he can. he's much more aligned to taking the pictures. He doesn't read a lot. Um, and so, yeah, they are Trump-proofing NATO. That includes in the Senate, well, I think, Cong uh, not Senate, Congress, had, did pass legislation to to mean that 
I don't think Trump can unilaterally take the US out of NATO. It would have to be agreed. I don't know if it's a supermajority in the Congress, but that's sensible uh, mitigation. But like why you would have to do that is, is worrying. And yet you still have so many of those people who voted for that to, to be in place because of the worry that Trump would be still sounding their public support for Trump is like, yeah. Most notably, allied countries have dramatically increased their own military spending. I spoke with several officials who grudgingly credited Trump for this development, something NATO officials and US residents, presidents sorry, had spent decades advocating for unsuccessfully. In 2017, when Trump took office, only three allies, so as far back as 2017, there were only three, plus the US. Uh, so it's four of them. Yeah, I think it was, was it Poland, Greece, UK and the US, so four of them, uh, were spending at least 2% on, on, of their GDP on defence. This year, their number is expected to rise to at least 18. Massive change. Trump's criticism of poultry defence budgets uh, was not only effective, Stoltenberg told me, but fair. Quote, European allies have not spent enough for many years, he said. No doubt Russia's invasion of Ukraine also factored into the increased spending. Now, for what it's worth, I think, one, Trump was right to call out Europe for not paying enough. OK, I, I will I will say that was the case. Europe was not spending enough on their insurance policy, defence, and, and therefore not enough for NATO. So that's the first thing I'd say. Second, it, they didn't start spending more because Trump asked them to. They started spending more. If you look at the exact time they all started spending more, oh, it was February 2022 and onwards. They're spending more on defence because of Ukraine war. Is no one's doing it because Trump asked them. So the idea, and Trump will take responsibility for that, but I think that is that is not fair. Um, although he did ask for it, it just correlates that with the the idea of the Europeans doing it. But the war has an awful lot more to do with spending on defence and helping out Ukraine and uh, than than Trump's influence there. Uh, I would also argue that, as I have several times before, that there are some ramifications that are potentially negative for the US with European nations spending more. So although I think that's a good thing and that should happen, from a US hegemonic point of view, as in the supreme power point of view, being the big player in NATO, right, you can complain they're not paying enough, but what it means is you control NATO much more than them. You're a much bigger player. You've got a much bigger army. You spend way more. They spend phenomenal amounts, the Americans. They have a much bigger economy, so 2% of their GDP equates to an awful lot more than 2% of Belgium's GDP, right? And also population-wise, et cetera, et cetera. The US spend a phenomenal amount, but the more Europe spend on defense the more they become independent from u.s influence and also the more they demand spending on their own military so you had a complaint from thierry breton this week saying it is absolutely unacceptable that we in europe are spending 80 percent at times of our defense on u.s equipment in other words the more Europe become independent from the US. It's not a case of the more they spend, well, then the 80% of more they spend is spent on the US. Actually, they've changed the strategy so that 60% of US, EU spending now has to be in, inside the EU. So actually, there's this move away from American dominance to not only um, defence and security independence, but economic and military industrial concern independence from the US. In other words, we, we might have our own problems, we'll need to solve them with our, our own solutions. And if we're relying all the time on the US for both the material, and, but also for, uh, you know, depending on their industries, then it doesn't give us independence. It's the same way that Europe, Europe's dependence on Russian hydrocarbons meant that Russia had that influence and that leverage over Europe. So, okay, we, in the same way, we don't want the US to have leverage over us, so we want to become more independent. So the more that the US demands that the EU becomes independent and spends more on its, its militaries and does more for NATO, the less 
the US is needed and the less influence the US has on those nations. It can't say, look, we're the big, we're the big guys around here. You need to do X, Y, and Z, and everyone that follows along doing that. Europe then says, well, actually, no, because we're all much more equal players in this now. And if we don't think that's what needs to happen, then we ain't doing that. And so there are ramifications for what people like Trump were asking for. As long as we all understand that, I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. I don't really know. I, I I did a whole segment on this previously saying I'm not really sure what the answer is. Like Europe becoming more independent has its own benefits and its own drawbacks. To, and it also depends on which point of view you're taking. If you're a, a, an American, you want the US to be the top of the ladder. And if you're European, you want Europe to be the top of the ladder. So it, it's completely dependent on your point of view. Even with the funding influx, many officials believe Europe still has a long way to go before it can defend itself alone. The US has some 85,000 troops currently stationed in Europe, more than the entire militaries of Belgium, Sweden and Portugal combined, and provides essential intelligence gathering, ballistic missile defence and air force capabilities. Quote, dreaming about strategic autonomy for Europe is a wonderful vision for maybe the next 50 years. Ischinger, the former German ambassador, told me, but right now we need America more than ever. The reality has left politicians and diplomats across Europe honing their theories of Trump ego management ahead of the US election. To some, the former president's emotional volatility represents a grave threat. The former diplomatic official in Berlin told me that in May 2020, Merkel called Trump to inform him that she wouldn't be travelling to Washington for the G7 summit out of concern for COVID. Trump was enraged, according to the diplomat who requested anonymity to describe a private conversation, and the call grew heated. A week later, Trump announced a plans to permanently withdraw nearly 10,000 troops from Germany, a move seen but within Merkel's government of, as a petty act of revenge. Biden later reversed the order. A spokesperson for the Trump campaign did not respond for a request for comment. It's really interesting. That volatility is well known in Trump. He's very vengeful. Talk about what's going on with the conviction recently in the New York court. He's talking about taking revenge on all people who, who were involved in that. And, you know, heads will roll where, if he gets to become... Uh, president again he is an incredibly vengeful person others um think trump's ego make him e ego make could make him easier to manipulate quote he's very transactional and he's very narcissistic i've talked a lot about this uh there are lots of papers written on trump's uh, transactional approach to politics actually you should go and check him out the senior nato official who's met trump multiple times told me quote and if you combine the two narcissism and transactionality you then you can sell him the official paused he recited an expression in his native language roughly translated means you can sell him turnips if they're lemons in other words you know you can take advantage of him uh because he is prone to that narcissism it, he goes in a meeting with putin and comes out all lovey-dovey loved up with Putin Putin has just manipulated him that's what's happened and it, King John Un you can say the same and all these leaders Xi Jinping especially since he has this this delight in strong men that you go and be that strong man in front of him and Trump will fawn over that and that means well there's a way in there I can manipulate you what's striking about these calculations is how thoroughly allies have already adjusted their perception of the US relationship. I noticed a certain pattern in my conversations with European political leaders and diplomats. At some point in almost every interview, the European would begin pitching me on how much the US benefits economically from the alliance. Preserving peace in Europe has sustained decades of lucrative trade for US companies. Exactly what I was talking about. So that the US doesn't pays much more than other nations on their defence, for the, therefore does more for NATO, if you like, is to the benefit of the US because through that alliance they get all these trade deals, etc, etc. And you've also got to remember, and I don't think people realise this, you're not paying into NATO. Like spending 2% of your GDP is spending 2% on your defence in your country. What that really says is the more you stimulate your own economy, the more you qualify for NATO. So that the US spends more on its its own defences is part of its military economic strategy that's had that it's had in place for many, many decades in a way that other countries simply don't. And so you aren't like NATO is an alliance, but it's not like you're paying more, more for this thing. Like you've all bought a pizza, right? And the pizza costs 20 pounds. And actually, I spent twelve pounds of that, so I should get a, you know, 
12 out of 20 pieces. That's not how it works. It's like the NATO is just an alliance and you're paying for your equipment. Now, what that means is if NATO's called into action, then these guys don't have as much equipment as you. And that then could become a bit of a problem. But as mentioned, the only time NATO has been called into action really is Article 5 in after 9-11. And so, yeah, it's just worth remembering that um, because I think we, we often forget it. Um, but anyway... Uh, at some, yes, at some point in almost a, a, every interview I'll repeat, the European would begin pitching me on how much the US benefits economically from the alliance. Preserving peace in Europe has sustained decades of lucrative trade for US companies. A broader Russian war on the continent would be felt in the average American's pocketbook. I later learned that these talking points were being encouraged by NATO officials as well as the US State Department. The thinking behind the strategy is that Americans need to hear why supporting European allies is in their self-interest. I talked about this an awful lot over the course of the war, that at the beginning of the war it was all about the moral uh, dynamic of the of the war and supporting Ukraine but after a certain point people have been saturated by the that moral evaluation and there needs to be more to convince them that spending that money is in their best interest and so you actually have to set, sell the self-interest of the US in supporting Ukraine to the American public they need to understand that it's a stimulus for their own e economy it's upgrading their own armed forces it's about influence operations around the world it's about the zero-sum game this is a zero-sum game when it's like you're talking about Russian power and Chinese power or US and EU power like do who would you rather like if we don't help Ukraine Russia wins and that is them winning in that power dynamic which then decreases our power around the world which then will decrease our ability to have lucrative trade deals to the to the uh, amount that we had so on and so forth and then there's this isolationism we retreat from the world we have no influence in the world this is about return on investment the more we invest in the world the more we get back from the world etc etc that's your self-interest for the US and that's what needs to be sold to the sold to the general public but they don't know that they just they're not cognizant of these arguments and they need to be made much more forcefully quote they keep telling us how important it is to go and convince the housewives in Wisconsin and the farmers in Iowa, a senior official told an ally country uh, from an ally country grumbled to me, quote, how many Americans are going to the housewives of southern Estonia or the countryside in France to tell why Europe should stand by the United States? He noticed that the alliance prote protects the US as well. The more I listened to prime ministers and parliamentarians deliver the same earnest spiel, the more dispiriting I found it. At its most idealistic, the transatlantic alliance has always been about a shared commitment to democratic values. Now Europeans are bracing for an America that behaves like any other transactional superpower. Several officials expressed fears that Trump would turn Na America's NATO membership into a kind of protection racket, threatening to abandon Europe unless the this ally offers better trade terms or that ally helps investigate a political got enemy wow right this is absolutely on point so trump's transactional nature means that nato becomes a point of leverage which is that if you don't pay more into nato it's not into NATO. if you don't pay more of your defense then we won't do this so we we're going to use this to extract more out of you or or using nato as a means to leverage something in some part of the world or uh, we will provide weapons to you, Zelensky. This is what happened in 2019 uh, and, and before. But I want political dirt on Biden. And that is, that's just how the man operates. We are exposed, Bagger, the German State Tech Secretary told me. Europe's alliance with America, he said, quote, has served as our life insurance for the last 70 years. And with Vladimir Putin seizing territory in Europe and trying to unravel NATO, what choice would these countries have but to accept Trump's terms? Uh, so it is like a protection racket, you know, where where you say, right, you need to pay me, you need to pay me, you need to pay me, or you won't get X, Y, and Z. Yeah, as as a, the mafia member goes around these different stores exacting um, cost out of them uh, and saying, you know, we'll protect you if you pay us this, you pay us this, you know, you need to pay more. Uh, and if you don't pay us more, then this is going to happen. If you don't pay us more, then that's going to happen. And it's a way of, yeah, we're protecting you. But in a way, I'm using this to control you and to have influence over you. And, and the idea is that that's how uh, Trump sees NATO in terms of what it can uh, do to benefit him in his role as as U.S. president, so on and so forth, uh, uh, and there's obviously you know more in this article goes on to talk about Estonia. Um, yeah, it's a 
a really interesting article there. So now we're going to go on to this. So a very vocal percentage of the US political class, celebrities, billionaires and influencers have become radical radicalized by Russian propaganda to the extent that they themselves are now conduits of verbatim Russian disinformation narratives. A recent study breaks down who is who. This is scary, right? And it also shows you how I think infiltrated the American right is. And I know some, many of you who will be watching this who sit on the American right will be going, rah, 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 rah. but actually the empirical data is that far more of the American right are spouting Russian propaganda than the American left. And here is that empirical data. And so we'll just go through this. Um, so from Trumpists to communists, the forces in the US impending impeding aid to Ukraine and how they do it. Okay, so in April 2022, Congressman Mark Amaday praised Ukrainians for their efforts in fighting for their independence and emphasized the importance of supporting them. He backed all pro-Ukrainian initiatives in Congress. However, in April 2024, he unexpectedly voted against allocating aid to Ukraine. In September 2023, Senators Tom Cotton and Lindsey Graham wrote a letter to President Joe Biden urging him to provide Ukraine with eight Atkins missiles ranging from 165 to 270 kilometers, depending on the particular model. By February 2024, however, they voted against a bill proposing aid for Ukraine, only to vote in favor of it in April. Graham and Cotton are, are not the only flip-flopping politicians in the US Congress. Such inconsistency in decisions can also be observed in other American politicians. Why do these fluctuations occur? Texty.org.ua decided to research the reasons expressed by the media and expert communities contributing to political dis discordance within the decision-making establishment. As a result, we identified a wide range of groups opposing support for Ukraine, from Trump supporters to communists, and explored the ecosystem of mutual support among those who told this position. However, although they have to say from Trump supporters to communists looking at two ends of the spectrum, it's not a both sidesism. It's from Trump to, to communists is like that, right? Uh, statistically, as we'll see. It goes on to talk about Mike Johnson. Obviously, you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene. You've got the d delay in aid. You've got NGOs working, a numerous NGOs, well-known activists, political commentators, uh, and in the US consistently advocate for American isolationism and oppose support for Ukraine. Their stance is significant in the context of the ongoing war, given Ukraine's heavily, heavy reliance on US assistance, which is increasingly challenging to secure. We've identified a broad spectrum of aid opponents, ranging from Trump supporters to communists, and examined their connections. While the research does not cover every public figure opposing aid to Ukraine, it highlights prominent individuals and common arguments that often mirror Kremlin propaganda. So there are 392 individuals and 76 organizations. So the individuals there are in a um, in that bluish color, teal, that's the color, and 76 organizations in that sort of more puce color in our list. Uh, th and they're split into politics, media, and experts. These includes politicians, political movements and groups, media and journalists, uh, experts and think tanks. Some individuals appear in multiple categories. A little more than half of the individuals in this sample are right wing. So over 50% are right wing, but that doesn't mean the rest of them are left wing. About one in eight are left wing. So one in two, over one in two, are right wing and one in eight are left wing. That's a really significant difference. I, it, it truly is. Um, so the right wing individuals are mostly politicians affiliated with, uh, uh, sorry, and the rest do not associate themselves with a specific ideological platform. The right wing individuals are mostly pol politicians affiliated with the Trump wing of the Republican Party. Most of the left wing individuals are anti-war activists and left leaning parties that urge the government to stop funding Ukraine. Most of the media journalists, experts and think tanks in this list do not have a clear left or right bias. OK, so look at the size of the right compared to the left. So when you as someone who has spent two years talking about this war and advocating for support for Ukraine, is there any wonder I spend more time um, being critical of the of the right and the far right than I do of the left and far left? Is there any surprise? Like here is some empirical data to say that what like four is it four times as many individuals and organizations are actually more individuals organizations interestingly are, are take up a larger position like anti-war organizations there but on on are on the right than on the left and that is i think a really significant difference 
Out of these, 50 individuals have collaborated with Russian media and government-funded initiatives during the Russia's full-scale invasion of the Ukraine war of Ukraine. Uh, and some have moved to Russia and the occupied territories of Ukraine. Around 30 journalists and influencers work as reporters and contributors for Russian media and also serve as observers at legal referendums in Russian occupied territories. You can think of people like Lancaster, um, there and uh, Wyatt, uh, what's his name, who, who was working for the Grey Zone, works for Sputnik. And of course, we're going to talk about investors and venture capitalists. Uh, technologies from Starlink and Palantir, owned by Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, are aiding Ukrainians in their conflict, necessitating an explanation for their inclusion in the list. After Elon Musk acquired the Twitter network, now X, Russian propaganda significantly ramped up on the platform. He frequently shares with his 187 million followers a highly sceptical view of the United States' financial support for Ukraine, aligning with Russian narratives. Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal and Palantir, advocates for isolationism in modern US politics and is a key investor in influential Republicans like Blake Masters and J.D. Vance. I didn't know this. I was wondering why J.D. Vance is so anti-Ukraine and is touted to be the vice president for Trump. I get it now. Follow the money. He is being invested in by Peter Thiel, who is uh, rather along that line of thinking. So Peter Thiel, in 2021, Peter Thiel, J.D. Vance and Vivek Ramaswamy invested in the social network Rumble, which is a right-wing answer to YouTube. This platform became an alternative for the then-banned Donald Trump on Twitter and the blocked Russian media outlet Russia Today, RT, in 2022. Billionaire Ramaswamy dubbed the young Trump withdrew from the presidential race to support Trump. They both publicly exchanged compliments and planned to collaborate. Ramaswamy has frequently made headlines with his anti-Ukrainian statements claiming, quote, Putin was able to seize eastern Ukraine because there was no resistance there like in the rest of Ukraine because, quote, the eastern regions of Ukraine are Russian-speaking and do not even consider themselves part of Ukraine. I mean, classic Russian narrative, right? Quote, I think that's a fictitious scenario for a lot of reasons. Part of the reason Putin has been able to seize eastern Ukraine is that they have not had the same level of resistance as the rest of Ukraine. The eastern regions of Ukraine are Russian speaking and don't re even really view themselves as part of Ukraine. That is why there was no counterinsurgency or resistance. Of course, hasn't seen the polls from late 1991 that show very clear uh, desire for Russian independence. They moved lots of Russians in there and there is a therefore a false sense of who those people are, let alone what they believe. Ohio Senator J uh, J.D. Vance joins obstructing support for Ramaswamy in word and deed uh, with public statements and votes against in the Senate. Uh, in April 20th, 2023, Vance, uh, Vance, along with 18 other representatives of the U.S. Republican Party, signed a letter to U.S. President Joe Biden stating that Quote, unlimited U.S. assistance to Ukraine would be terminated and that the signatories of the letter, quote, we will adamantly oppose all future aid packages unless they are linked to a clear diplomatic strategy designed to bring the war to a rapid conclusion. Charles Koch, uh, so massive billi American billionaire who's associated with several think tanks like Stand Together, Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, the Cato Institute, that's a libertarian institute, and Concerned Veterans for America, which have taken to is an isolationist position regarding the Russian-Ukrainian war and advocate for not provoking Russia. Uh, to beware of escalation and forcing Ukraine to negotiate by limiting military support, etc. So on and so forth. You've got um, Grant Cardoni, a training company owner and Scientology, Scientology supporter, um, with 1.1 million follow followers on Twitter. Ben Cohen, um, co-owner of the Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream Company, who funds the Eisenhower Media Network, an organisation of military experts and um, veterans, uh, goodness me. So lots of these sort of think tanks, so on and so forth. So here we have a list of all the entities here and uh, you can go, you know, there's 47 pages of this, starting with Jordan Peterson, OANN, so that's a news organisation, Daily Wire, right-wing news organisation, both of those, Jordan Peterson, right-wing intellectual, Ben Sh Shapiro, right-wing quasi-intellectual, um, uh, David Sachs, Elon Musk, best mate, Ron DeSantis, Peter Thiel, RFK Jr. Uh, let, let's look at a few more of these. Uh, Jim Jordan, Don Trump, um, Center for Renewing America, Stand Together, Charles Koch, um, Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, I'm just trying to see people that I know here. Uh, the American Conservative, Tucker Carlson. Um, you've got uh, Blake Masters. J.D. Vance, Ron Johnson, Lauren Boebert, Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Jim Banks, Scott Perry, um, 
yeah, Paul Gosar, Andrew Napolitano, Carrie Lake, uh, Wendy Rogers, uh, Cato Institute, so on and so on. Rand Paul and Ron Paul, uh, both of those, goodness me. Uh, Jill Stein, interestingly, left wing one there. Um, Kevin, uh, Kevin Roberts, who is part of the uh, Heritage Foundation. He's the leader of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, all sorts of people, Elon Musk, um, so on and so forth. It's really quite depressing. And then it, it goes into uh, looking at the arguments for uh, Russia and against Ukraine. Peter and Putin, Christian values, um, so on and so forth. I mean, I could lose myself in this article with you over an awful long time. But we'll just look really quickly <laughs> uh, at a, a few more little elements here. So... It's the ecosystems and how they work together, uh, how right-wing and left-wing opponents of aid to Ukraine support and promote each other. So you've got persons and organisations uh, um, and how they how they are connected. And it's a fairly incredible bit of work done here. You notice Code Pink there. They're really prominent, this left-wing anti-war group that have done, I think, some fairly serious damage to um to support for Ukraine. Among the most significant nodes of connections between the opponents of aid to Ukraine are Donald Trump and his supporters, Senator J.D. Vance and media personality Tucker Carlson. So these sort of larger ones appear to have um, much greater pull. You know, you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene, Donald Trump, J.D. Vance. Um, that gets slightly smaller, Tucker Carlson there. Um, anyway, uh, Libertarian Party member Ron Paul, the Grey Zone website and its founder Max Blumenthal, left-wing anti-moral communities, Code Pink and the Massachusetts Peace Action, and far-right website Infowars and its editor Alex Jones, and many others. The ecosystem is current as of the beginning of May this year. The hypothetical lines of mutual support between individuals and organisations are drawn based on the following. So participation in joint events, organisations, campaigns and movements, joint publications and reprints, support during elections, both financial and verbal public support, complementary interviews, public support, statements and mutual sharing of content as a sign of support in particular reposts on social media involvement in the financing and activities of actions and or, or organizations so it looks then say at trump and his network and looks at how that that's mutually reinforcing in in favor of russia um, so the core of the effort is to decrease U.S. support for Ukraine, and it consists of Trump, uh, Trumpists, politicians, media figures, activists, and experts aligned with Donald Trump, including himself. And members of Congress aligned with him obstruct bills aiding Ukraine, with the most vocal ones spreading their views to millions via social media. Uh, though Trump has not directly opposed Ukraine post-invasion, he has noted that Russia, quote, will eventually take over all of Ukraine, frequently stating that Ukraine lacks the capability to, to, to defeat Russia. In April 2024, media outlets reported that Trump's, quote, secret peace plan suggesting that Ukraine should cede Crimea and Donbass to Moscow. In April 20th, 2024, just before the House of Representatives votes on Ukrainian aid, Trump didn't endorse the bill, but publicly recognised for the first time that, quote, Ukrainian survival and strength should be much more important to Ukraine. Europe than to us, but it is also important to us. He criticised European allies for their insufficient support to Ukraine. Itself a uh, disinformation. Despite his remarks, Trump remains a pivotal figure for those consistently against supporting Ukraine, according to our survey. In February 2023, a group of 10 Republicans, led by US House member Matt Gates, initiated the Ukraine Fatigue Resolution, advocating for the cessation of military and financial aid to Ukraine. Mr Gates has been a vocal critic of aid to Ukraine. He, along with co Sponsors like Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, Thomas Massey and Barry Moore in November 2022 pushed for a stronger audit of funds uh, for a stronger audit of funds the US provides to Ukraine. Even those who supported Ukraine in 2022 opposed it by early 2024, worried about a backlash from Trump supporters and aiming to maintain their career prospects within the Republican Party with Trump as a presidential candidate. Trump's campaign slogan that American taxpayer money should be only be used for the needs of American citizens is a defining feature of the presidential campaign for the upcoming elections in autumn 2024. His stance resonates with the views of Republicans who rose to power post-World War I. Trump's approach to foreign and domestic policy attracts many neoconservatives and far-right supporters 
supporters whose views are endorsed by the Heritage and Stand Together Foundations, the Cato Institute, conservative media such as One American News Network, Real America's Voice, The American Conservative, The Daily Wire, Breitbart News and Concerned Veterans for American Movement. The centre-right student organisation Turning Point USA, founded by Charlie Kirk, serves as a recruitment platform for Trump supporters and the Centre for Renewing America functions as a think tank. And it you know, goes into all of these um, organisations like Turning Point USA, uh, Tucker Carlson, a whole look at him, um, you know, Charlie Kirk, as, as we mentioned, Code Pink and the peace activists. They'll be more likely to be left wing aligned um, and uh, so on and so forth. It's just it's really worrying because all of these organisations together present an absolutely massive challenge to global security, to continued support for Ukraine, but also to the US's own strategic objectives. I mean, this is like I, I often see this like a virus that has got into the US system, into its people and is 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 a is able to essentially render the US less healthy democratically and politically and strategically there is a malaise at, at play here and it is it is a virus that has been developed by Russia and injected forcefully into the US I think it is incredibly incredibly worrying this it talks about RT and grey zone. I mean, I don't have time to go through all this, but this is an absolutely fascinating looking uh, analysis about all of these different uh, organizations and movements that rage against a war machine there. Um, that That is 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 truly worry, worrying conservatives and isolationists. Heritage Foundation. I th uh, Yeah, I think the Heritage Foundation is a real issue. I've written a massive article on them and how they are connected to uh, Viktor Orban's Hungary and thus to, to Russia. You've got Breitbart News, The Daily Wire. None of these are, are, are people I particularly like anyway, so it just doesn't surprise me that these guys, Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson, appear to be mouthpieces for uh, Russian propaganda. You've got Patrick Lancaster here, who is one of these guys that goes around uh, doing videos videos in in occupied Ukraine on behalf of Russia it's really really concerning um uh, anyway that's that uh, there's surely much more to say about that I will probably dip into this as I uh, as I go through different topics in further videos that might might touch on some of these people or some of these organizations but i'll put a link to this in the description because it is absolutely fascinating and it does show the huge influence on the public discourse that these people have and uh and it is it is truly uh, truly worrying anyway uh take care everybody speak to you soon